sorry, just trying to figure out the technology. Okay. I'd like to take this opportunity to say that I'm really grateful um, to the Sir Graham Smith Award for giving me the chance to carry out this piece of work. Um, the question I asked was how are multi-agency public protection arrangements map up <laughs> category three offenders managed within community sentences? Now, <clears throat> just to clarify, Category 3 macro offenders are those individuals who are considered to be other dangerous <coughs> offenders who pose a risk of serious harm and therefore require active multi-agency management. And therefore, these are offenders that could include people serving community orders, suspended sentence orders, or even who've been cautioned by the police. And really, what got me interested in this is because in, in my opinion, as a practitioner, I felt that the decisions that we make about these particular groups of offenders could teach us a lot of lessons in the lead up to the transform and rehabilitation changes, notably in that NPS will carry out all the initial assessments and that it's assumed that the majority will be considered not high risk and would be none of the cases and therefore would go across to the CRC. Now, with these community sentenced category three offenders, there are cases where the risk has escalated and a practitioner has had to make a, a, an assessment of those dynamic and acute risk factors and made a decision then to bring that offender into the MAPA system. And so these individuals in their small numbers actually could teach us a lot, contribute to professional knowledge and evidence-based practice about assessing and managing risk of serious harm and how we make defensible decision make, uh, decisions and also then set risk management plans. And so my research questions were focused on what dynamic risk factors and situational context are taken into account in order to identify these individuals. And so on a very small scale, um, I asked the, these questions, who are they? What are the sentences they're on? What risk assessments have been carried out? And what were the reasons for referral? What decision-making processes have been followed? And what were the agreed risk management plans? There's some key literature in this area, and much of them won't be a surprise, really. So the MAPA guidance gives a very clear set of expectations and directions about making defensible decisions and risk assessments. The NOMS Risk of Serious Harm guidance also encourages practitioners to act upon their assessments and to move their focus on from the assessments onto risk management. In fact, it is what staff do with an offender that is crucial. So the thematic inspection as well of MAPRA in 2011 was a key document. In there, the inspectors found that there were underdeveloped risk management plans and that much of the attention had been focused on restrictive controls and not enough on longer term uh, protective factors. The analysis as well of serious further offences in London um, was a key literature that I looked at and that really has pointed out that static factors need to be taken account of and used as a starting point but that what practitioners need to do is to look at situational context the dynamic factors that make a difference in order to try to identify who might pose a higher risk. And these issues were things such as instrumental violence, gang affiliations, um, belonging to a male criminal subculture. And then finally, Joanne Wood's work um, with the MAPA Level 3 offenders um, really was a key piece of work that I then looked at. In Wood's work, she found that breaches were the most common um, new convictions for MAPA Level 3 offenders. She also found that the Domestic Violence Risk Group had committed the most serious specified new offences, and that every group, regardless of whether or not they had sex offences, actually went on to commit new sexual offences. And so that is a reminder to us that we shouldn't allow that old adage that past behaviours are the best predictor of future behaviour to detract from the possibility of new offence patterns. So then my study. 
I took a mixed methods approach and I used the grounded theory analysis because essentially I didn't really know what I was going to find, I didn't know what to expect and so I allowed the data really to guide the concept. <laughs> the theoretical sampling that I did, from an initial list I sought out eligible cases and what made those cases eligible was confirmation that they were registered and managed as category 3 offenders within London and that they were indeed serving community sentences. So community orders, suspended sentence orders, and in one instance, a youth rehabilitation <coughs> order. The thematic coding then, first of all, used the, the information and phrases that were in those documents, then identified patterns, and then made links with the literature and developed more abstract understandings. So my secondary sources were the Electronic Oasis Risk of Serious Harm Analysis and the Risk Management Plans the MAPA referrals and MAPA minutes, and the National Delius case records. And in the end, there are actually 18 cases that I identified. The primary sources that I used were questionnaire responses from five practitioners, case discussions with five, uh, three practitioners, thank you, pardon, and then observation of two cases being discussed at MAPA level two meetings. So you can see there are many limitations. This study was carried out in a specific location, and I'm not making any claims that this, these findings could be generalized. Also, there was in fact a low response rate from practitioners. I, I had in fact invited 36 offender managers, but only a total of eight have had an input on this study. And the analysis I've done is simple statistics, and really it's a small scale, primarily qualitative study. So the key findings. And again, this is a whistle stop tour because there were so many complexities. So this is just an overview. As maybe could be expected, it is a predominantly male sample, 60 males with only two females. It was also a, a young sample with the under 30s making up half of the sample, although the age range was from 18 to 53. The community sentences were actually predominantly community orders, and every single order included a supervision requirement. <clears throat> In fact, the majority of the orders had a supervision requirement as a standalone or supervision plus one other requirement. And those requirements were really focused on rehabilitation. So as well as the supervision programs, mental health treatment or drug and alcohol treatment. So what I got a sense of was that these were individuals who were sentenced at a lower level of sentences, community orders as opposed to suspended sentence orders and with requirements that were really aimed at rehabilitation. The index offences, however, Public Order Act matters were high up on the list, as well as violence in relation to assaults and breach of protection orders, so breach of restraining orders, breach of non-molestation orders, and very few, in fact only three out of all of the offences were sh uh, Schedule 15 specified. So again, it's building up a picture that the sentencing, the point of sentencing, these were low level index offences in the sense that they weren't sh Schedule 15. And the MAPA level management was usually level two. I apologize for this graph. <laughs> um, <clears throat> essentially, given the prevalence of violent index offences, you would expect that the Oasis Violence Predictor, the OVP scores in these cases, would be high. But in fact, only four cases had a high OVP score category, meaning that they're of a high likelihood of reconviction for violence, and only one had very high. And so the majority of these cases had low and medium categorizations for the OVP. Now the question really is, and I don't have a definite answer because I was looking at secondary sources, but is this demonstrating that practitioners were actually making fluid assessments that reflected the dynamic nature of risk? However, OVP scores are supposed to, they do in fact, reflect dynamic factors that are assessed within the OASIS. So those dynamic issues should then have an impact on the OVP score. So then we turn to look at the risk of serious harm, because then is it perhaps that this is the focus of the decision making. And what we see is that in every case, in all 18 cases, there was an assessed level of risk in relation to the public 
and the majority of those were deemed to be a high risk of harm to the public, of serious harm to the public. Next on the list, we see that known adults, two-thirds of the cases, over two-thirds, had an assessment of risk in relation to known adults, and the majority were also deemed high risk. Now, these known adults were commonly victims of domestic violence, but that actually wasn't limited to partners and ex-partners. It included assessments of risk in relation to wider family members. Then finally, we have assessments in relation to risk of serious harm to staff. And this included consideration of criminal justice and non-criminal justice staff. But that, those were predominantly assessed as a medium risk of serious harm. And then the fewest risk of serious harm category um, was in relation to children. So what seemed to be the question at the heart of these assessments for the practitioners really was about who are we protecting and from what, rather than necessarily looking at OBP schools. So then, looking at the key findings and the reasons for referral. In keeping with Joanne Wood's work, actually what it showed was that there were multiples of risk. It was definitely more complex than just you know one particular thing. In the majority of cases, 13 of those cases, there are actually two or more risk factors that could be identified within the referral paperwork as the reason that the referral was made. I draw heavily on Joanne Wood's work. Um, the first category, emotional instability, using her phrase, was the one that was definitely you know, out there as, as the most common reason. And within that, it's broken down into mental health, which was often articulated as unpredictable behaviour, and that phrase came up lots in assessments and the referrals. And this unpredictability of behaviour was often referring to deteriorating behaviours that the offender managers were noticing in the individuals, having worked with them for a time, you know, so they understood how they presented. And there were warning signs linked to their non-compliance with medication or a complete lack of engagement with mental health services. And the decisions really seem to be taken based on the fact that staff deemed that there was a need for swift intervention to deal with these escalating risks. In relation to the suicide assessments, suicide concerns, in fact, all of those, so the three that were linked to mental health and the, one, uh, the two by themselves, all of those were assessed in relation to how that suicide concern exacerbated risk of harm to others. So it wasn't just looking at suicide in itself, but it was how that impacted on the risk to other people. And in the one case there of emotional instability related to mental capacity also really was an assessment in relation to the risk to others, because that was about a young man who was vulnerable, who was being drawn into violent gang activities due to his learning difficulties. Then next down, we see that domestic violence and child protection share the next um, area, really, in terms of the risks and reasons for referral. But this actually showed that there's a complexity of abuse within families because as I alluded to earlier, this wasn't only about violence against partners and ex-partners, it included violence against um, the offender's own relatives and included biological children, stepchildren, and also their wider relatives who were of a younger age, under 18. <coughs> Next down we see the violence, which is referring to generic violence, weapons and threats to kill, and then gang, second from the bottom. Both of those factors were actually lower than I expected. They weren't as prominent. And it could be, I speculate that it could be due to the fact that the, the sample was actually community-sentenced individuals. A glance at the custody cases show that there were actually far many more instances of serious group offending registered. But also, it, it points to the fact that often the assessments were focusing their attention on the links to emotional instability issues and domestic violence issues as a major concern. Uh, just a note to say that the hate crime, the two hate crime cases also were really linked in with mental health concerns. And the sexual <coughs> offending, half of those were actually in relation to allegations that came about through intelligence disclosures and not actually in relation to convictions that were ever um, 
pursued or gained. So again, key findings, looking at the risk management. Now, the majority of cases had an agreed risk management plan in place, the six and the seven there. The issue is that more than half of those actually were not really agreed risk management plans in the way they were recorded because they were simply copied from the offender manager's referral and those were copied from the OASIS. And so what this meant, unfortunately, is that those agreed risk management plans actually didn't incorporate the actions that had been agreed within the MAPA for contributions from other agencies. And the joint inspection actually found this trend as well. Now, really, I think this is an error in recording practice because I could see, looking at the case records, looking at the rest of the MAPA minutes, that there were, in fact, planned actions um, that should really then have been transferred over into an agreed risk management plan. So the work seemed to be set and would be done, but unfortunately wasn't recorded in the correct place that it should be within the MAPA paperwork. So in terms of having the agreed risk management plan in the lead agency, the panel seemed to be working on the basis that whichever responsible authority had made the referral would take on the lead agency role as well. But the plans were really of a restrictive short-term focus in terms of restrictive controls. And there wasn't really any obvious contingency planning. And unfortunately, the long-term aims weren't the focus either. And really, the practitioners, when I spoke with practitioners in case discussions and the responses from them in the questionnaires, indicated that practitioners did have these longer term aims in mind. One of the key reasons for making the referral into MAPA for Category 3 in the minds of practitioners was to gain access to resources. And in their opinion, this often fast-tracked their offenders into much-needed resources. And interestingly, this is also something that the Joint Inspection found, that the duty to cooperate agencies often increased their action on such cases by virtue of the fact that MAPA was negotiating, you know, directing this kind of work. Another thing that practitioners really valued was the fact that it allowed them to have multi-agency solutions, and that's using a phrase from a practitioner. And this, as we can see, with the prominence of mental health issues was often in relation to accessing further assessment for mental health services but also housing featured quite high up on those solutions it was crucial to know the whereabouts of their offenders and so having secure housing was one of the the major achievements that they felt they could gain through the map referral there really are complexities um, in in the way that these cases need to be managed and it requires those different perspectives and different approaches. And the duty to cooperate agencies had a very clear role in how those other aspects of risk could be managed. So there was no simple formula, except to say that the assessment that was conducted, really, it was clear that that then had to lead into some risk management strategies that were very clear. And the implications for the future. A recurring theme in all of these cases was the fact that the community <coughs> sentences had proved ineffective to manage the risks and the offender manager's referrals were an attempt to improve the effectiveness and to gain access to additional resources that would strengthen their risk management strategies. I think there was, it was no coincidence that every single one of those orders included a supervision requirement whereby an offender manager had taken responsibility for and was actively seeking to manage <coughs> risk and to secure multi-agency collaboration in order to do so. And so we're reminded of the fact that, you know, these are difficult offenders with dynamic change in risk profiles. And in order for us to actually, you know, take account of the risk of serious harm, we do need to use the actuarial tools as a starting point, but there needs to be confidence in being able to engage with those dynamic and qualitative aspects of risk. And so ended with some key messages. I think it, it goes without saying, risk assessment and the decision itself to refer into MAPA is not the end in itself. 
practitioners need to have you know an ongoing and dynamic engagement with the risk assessment process and that needs to be something that feeds into a robust risk management plan so there needs to be a clear idea about how MAFA will add value to and improve the work with the case the active interagency and multi-agency working needs to be clearly agreed and coordinated there needs to be full use of avenues for communication and sharing of information in order to access resources and provisions. So for example, professionals meetings, the use of other fora like MARAC for domestic violence cases, child protection case conferencing, the care programme approach for mental health cases, all of these avenues need to be used to full effect before and throughout any referral into MAPA. And I think something that you know comes about when we forget about the longer term aim, we need to remember that risk of serious harm management and assistance from offending in the longer term are actually corresponding aims. So the use of interventions for rehabilitation and in an effort to develop protective factors should, should not be forgotten, even when risk management plans do need to prioritise those immediate restrictive controls. Say very much with my probation officer hat on. Frontline practitioners, whether we're going to be in MPS or CRC, we are going to need to have these professional skills in order to identify and act upon escalating risk of serious harm indicators. And so, all aspects of the offender management role, working to reduce re offending, having the belief in people's ability to change, managing risk of serious harm, identifying the warning signs. You know, working in the long term, these are responsibilities that we have to carry on doing and fulfilling, and they cannot and should not be fragmented because we are dealing with the complexities of human behaviour.